protest against World War I was that of Eugene Debs, the railroad union organizer and leader of the Socialist Party. On June 18, 1918, he addressed a mass rally of workers in Ohio, knowing that his words could lead, as they did, to his arrest and imprisonment. His sentence of 10 years was upheld by unanimous Supreme Court decision. Here is the speech that led to his arrest. Sam Johnson declared that patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. He must have had the Wall Street gentry in mind, or at least their prototypes. For in every age it has been the tyrant, the oppressor, and the exploiter who has wrapped himself in the cloak of patriotism, or religion, or both, to deceive and overawe the people. Every solitary one of these aristocratic conspirators and would-be murderers claims to be an arch-patriot. Every one of them insists that the war is being waged to make the world safe for democracy. What humbug! What rot! What false pretense! Wars throughout history have been waged for conquest and plunder. In the Middle Ages, when the feudal lords concluded to enlarge their domains, to increase their power, their prestige, and their wealth, they declared, they declared war upon one another. But they themselves did not go to war. Any more than the modern feudal lords, the barons of Wall Street, go to war. The feudal barons of the Middle Ages, the economic predecessors of the capitalists of our day, declared all wars and their miserable serfs fought all the battles. The poor, ignorant serfs have been taught to revere their masters, to believe that when their masters declared war upon one another, it was their patriotic duty to fall upon one another and to cut one another's throats for the profit and glory of the lords and barons who held them in contempt. And, and what is war in a nutshell? The master class has always declared the wars, the subject class has always fought the battles. The master class has had all to gain and nothing to lose, while the subject class has had nothing to gain and all to lose, especially the lives. They have, always, they have always taught and trained you to believe it to be your patriotic duty to go to war and to have yourselves slaughtered at their command. But in all the history of the world, you, the people, have never had a voice in declaring war. And strange as it certainly appears, no war by any nation in any age has ever been declared by the people. The working class who fight all the battles, the working class who make the supreme sacrifices, the working class who freely shed their blood and furnish their corpses, have never yet had a voice in either declaring war or making peace. It is the ruling class that invariably does both. They alone declare war and they alone make peace. Yours not to reason why, yours but to do and die. That is their motto. And we object on the part of the awakening workers of this nation, if war is right, let it be declared by the people. Hello, this is uh, Dan Shea with, uh, <coughs> excuse me, with uh, Veterans for Peace Forum. Uh, we come to you every uh, fourth Saturday of the week uh, at Metro East um, uh, Community uh, Media here out in Gresham. Um, 
I'd like to uh, thank my uh, producers, uh, Kelly Labonte and Jim Lockhart, who have been made this program available to us. I have two guests today. Uh, we were planning on just having one, but we had a guest come to town, an old friend, uh, Benji Lewis, uh, with IVAW Oregon uh, and with Courage to Resist, uh, who also had gone about, about a year ago now down to uh, Venezuela and didn't return. <laughs> it's nice he's back now all of a sudden. And uh, uh, Laura Taylor with um, uh, AKS uh, LT. <laughs> uh, LT uh, is with the uh, Civilian Soldier Alliance uh, U.S. Uh, Social Forum uh, and um, she was she grew up here in Portland so she's uh, another native born like myself. Uh, one thing that uh, I think that that video had to say was the idea of I thought it was very appropriate because we're talking about how civilians get involved in the issues about war and peace. Uh, and then we have IBAW, uh, <clears throat> an Iraq veteran who's who served in that war. And your brother also happened to be an Iraq veteran, is mm -hmm. that correct? Uh, so we want to talk about how people can get involved in these issues and talk about, uh, first of all, I think I'll talk, start with you, uh, Laura. Uh, and tell us a little bit about um, uh, the uh, Civilian Soldier Alliance and where it started, how it got started, and what you're doing here in Portland. Okay. Um, well, the Civilian Soldier Alliance was started by civilian allies, a lot of folks active in the anti-war movement, in other kinds of community organizing, um, trying to support Iraq veterans against the war as it was getting started, um, you know, bringing experience as organizers, tools of direct action, all of that stuff to the table and um, has been going through this process of um, trying to figure out like it is it, as in um, Vietnam and, and previous history you know like GI resistance has had a really huge role in ending these wars so how do we support that and, and a big um, component of that is that in um, you know Vietnam is sort of touted as the successful example of of, of GI resistance and um, the sort of ratio of civilian support to GI resistors was much bigger and it is our responsibility to continue to like mobilize that support and so that's what Civilian Soldier Alliance does is trains folks on uh, how to work with veterans, what to say, what not to say, what you know and why is GI resistance like a strategic component of ending the war and you know why should we refocus the leadership of our movement on veterans. So, um, yeah, so we just have been recently doing a lot of trainings around that and just got together with um, some leaders and organizers from IVAW and did a big visioning about our next steps. That was so, in Chicago? Yep. And that was part of the social forum or was that outside? It the was a lead up to the social forum. forum. It was kind okay. of us all getting on the same page to. So, how many people were there at that? Um, there were about 40. 40 people? About 20 allies and 20 veterans. So, okay. Yeah. And so, uh, take us through that process a little bit. I mean, as though we're in that workshop, or and how, how did it go? Um, it went great. I I would say that um, it was a process of, of training each other and like sharing our own experiences. And the most important thing in that space was building trust, mm -hmm. both as organizers and as people. So sharing personally and then beginning to trust each other in this model that we're choosing to take forward, which is a model of leadership development and transformative organizing um, with with the idea that you know we're building we're building power among service members and veterans and you know allies civilians play a certain role in that um, but that's where the leadership is and so our whole training was sort of was sort of oriented around that we had lots of um, breakout groups with allies taking a break in a separate space and veterans um, holding a separate space to to take on those decisions, like the decision of the campaign that came out of that. And, um, and the campaign is? The campaign is focusing on um, getting proper mental health care for veterans and also um, stopping the redeployment of service members who've experienced trauma. So. Well, now you, now you just heard that the uh, VA has finally said that they're going to take all veterans that are coming back and begin a process of not denying them their post-traumatic, just accepting the idea that they have that. Mm -hmm. But what there's some problems with that. Can, do you know uh, what that is? Or uh, uh, I, I have an idea, but I want to see what you guys learned. <laughs> well, what are your what are your? Well, one of the thing 
there, I mean, it's really great because I think we have to say that it's been veterans groups and veterans organizations and people that care about veterans pushing that uh, the VA recognize that these people that are returning are dealing with a lot of uh, mental health issues. I wouldn't call it mental health, really. I mean, uh, I would say post-traumatic stress is, is more than uh, a mental health issue. It's an issue of, of betrayal. It's an issue of seeing your friends die. Uh, and even the, your feelings and compassion for other human beings that became your victims in these wars. Um, but what happens in, in this thing, is that, that's great that they're starting to accept these because so many veterans are waiting a long time to try and either uh, be recognized for their post-traumatic stress uh, or they just kept getting put off, put off. And because they already suffer from post-traumatic stress, bureaucracy pisses them off and they walk away from it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I know Benji did that. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And I, I've, I, I did it for many, many, many years. Um, so, but what this is, is it's recognizing them, but then they're, they're saying, you know, the diagnosis will be the diagnosis of the VA. Uh, the diagnosis does have, uh, there's no appeals process. If there's no appeals process, who's doing the interviewing, you know, and whose uh, uh, concerns is it to say somebody, uh, is only bothered by this. How long is that interview process? I went to a VA uh, therapist, uh, less than 15 minutes, made a diagnosis. Uh, I've been going to a therapist for uh, six months, had a different diagnosis, mm -hmm. uh, a higher rating of disability. How does, how does somebody who, who only met with me for 15 minutes and pissed the hell out of me, you know, uh, could make a diagnosis? And make that decision, and if it's if it's the way it is, they're talking about doing it here, uh, and then that diagnosis sticks, and you have no appeal. Right now, they recognize outside uh, therapists and and professionals to, to make a diagnosis and to offer that for your uh, uh, disability hearing. So that's a really important process. So I I have problems with that. Now that's an issue that should be raised both on civilian and veterans issues and sort of an advocacy of how you're going to attack or address those issues and talk to the VA about those things at the same time. Mm -hmm. We need, we, you know, for me as a veteran, I have real problems of trust with uh, the administrative parts of government. The people that work in the hospital, I, I, I adore because a lot of people have just been tremendously helpful and a lot of people on the outside, civilians that are volunteering their time have been tremendously helpful. But I question when money is involved and the government is saying we're going to cut budgets here, uh, how these diagnoses are going to come down the pike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, and whose who's interests are at play of like who, how many people get diagnosed? Like probably we want like 2.5 people a month or, you know, like however that plays out. But um, yeah, I think that's interesting and is relevant to, to this pressure that we're trying to apply in this power that we're trying to build because, you know, historically, like, social services have been used to kind of um, placate, right? Like, so it's very evident across the country right now that mental health for veterans and service members is a huge problem. There's people refusing to deploy. There's lots of examples of resistance. And so, yeah, a way of, of, of sort of quelling that, that energy. Now, another part of this, you're talking about uh, it's, it's, to build the GI resistance movement. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let's talk about that a little bit. During the uh, Vietnam War, of course, we had Vietnam veterans against the war, and now we have a similar thing called Iraqi veterans against the war, which is really Iraq and Afghanistan veterans against the war. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> those people are coming out. There's a difference between uh, those people who are um, uh, conscientious objector mm -hmm. and those who are may not consider themselves as an, a conscious objector or don't qualify for that, but are resisting. What does resistance mean in this as, as a, for a veteran? And how can civilians be supportive in that? For a veteran, what does resistance mean? Yeah. Um, or I mean, for a soldier even serving, I should say. For service members or veterans. I mean, I think um, that can take a lot of forms and it's like really important to recognize that whole spectrum, like anything from like slowdowns while you're, you know, at like, while you're deployed or, um, you know, various ways in which people would keep themselves and other people out of harm's way, out of, you know, conviction or practical, we need to survive, you know, that's, those are all legitimate forms of resistance, right? And then 
I think, um, you know, veterans specifically have a huge role to play in, like, continuing to advocate for, you know, like, um, have maybe somewhat more um, ability to speak once they're once they're out, right? For um, for what's needed, and and um, as a as a direct link between um, a lot of those. Um, well, well, I guess the way that one way that we've thought about it as civilians is, and working with veterans, right? Because that's population that's that's out in civilian society, right? And then the veterans have the strongest connection and the most um, relationship building power with active duty service members. So it's kind of like this this process of of support and and building to the point of um, you know GI resistance movement in in the sense of like active. Uh, withdrawal of of support of those occupations. Well, let's let's ask Benji a little bit. What's GI resistance movement mean to you? Well, I mean, I like the way you framed it. I mean, there's resistance within the GI world takes on all sorts of dimensions, of course. But I really look at the veterans movement as just sort of another arm in in a social movement, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's a valuable arm, especially in the United States. That's a very militant culture. It's been indoctrinated to be as such. And so you have people that have been there that can come out and speak the truth, and that really means worlds to people that hear it for the first time who have no idea. They see the news every single day. You know, I just saw it the other day on the news that um, you know, we're pulling out of Iraq, which was just came after the announcement that we're not going to be pulling out of Afghanistan. But I mean, if you follow the news for the last, uh, I don't know, since they invented television, you know, we're, we're always pulling out of war. But right. I mean, we, we average a major war every 20 years. And, uh, you know, so... In Afghanistan, for example, it just came out with uh, that they're, they're inadvertently, you know, I'm sure, funding both sides of the war in that sex and the Taliban may have interest in prolonging that war for profit purposes, which, you know, is of course, but also that's biased because obviously the U.S. military has their own agenda and they're very interested in continued destabilization in the region. So we need a broad-based movement that uh, is really looking at a structural change of society itself. And uh, I really see GI resistance as being, you know, a crucial arm in that, but it's not the only. And we, uh, with civilian alliances, such like that, sort of uh, reintegrating the movement, as it were. Well, one thing that comes to me is that most people, uh, I, I've been indoctrinated through the television and through these news programs, that say if you're you know if you're in the streets and you're uh, t calling for peace that you're basically not supporting your troops that you <laughs> that you're not supporting mm -hmm. the, your 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 people there but so to me it means that what's great about veterans coming out and speaking and telling the truth is that here's somebody who has served in there they become credible to the I found that speaking before uh, the civilian audiences is that they give me a lot of credit just because I had served Mm -hmm. I mean, every person's voice should be valued, but it, it's because I was there and it was in a, served in a combat area, they want to hear what I have to say. Right. You know, and when I, if I'm sitting there saying it and you're sitting there saying it uh, versus a civilian saying it who never served, mm -hmm. it has resonance in it throughout the community. So that opens the door for the community to begin to at least uh, begin to question what they've been told. Mm -hmm. And in that process, they want to know how can they help veterans you know I mean I haven't heard anybody no matter what side that whether they were pro-war or, uh, or against war or whatever uh, uh, talk about they didn't want to see veterans get their benefits mm -hmm. everybody wants to see the right wing says it the, the left wing uh -huh. says it uh -huh. everybody in between so everybody wants to to, to see that vet, veterans gets their benefits but Congress keeps holding up benefits uh, the VA keeps holding up vet benefits mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so seems like it'd be a natural alliance for advocacy. Advocacy for rights and benefits mm -hmm. uh, that veterans uh, need for their education, for their health care. Um, and many people, you know, they're, they're not just uh, 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 having de dealing with post-traumatic stress. It's over 350,000 uh, uh, soldiers, uh, and that was 2006 figures with post-traumatic stress. But they also have traumatic brain injuries, mm -hmm. they have uh, missing arms and limbs, uh, and not to mention the, those that have been uh, killed uh, over in Iraq. 
um, not just the people that were in combat, but those people through other services, being in the military mm -hmm. just by accidents. Yeah. And in the family. Uh, yeah, in the family. Uh, and then the suicide rates that, that, that occur. So there's something that that part of advocacy I don't see a problem with so much. The problem I really see is the problem of GI resistance movement, creating a movement where the, the general public then uh, realizes that, for me, it meant uh, resistance meant uh, refusing to cooperate in these uh, 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 corporate wars, uh -huh. Uh -huh. refusing to be a part of a system that that denigrates one nation over another nation so that it can grab their resources or just for hegemony and power uh -huh. in those nations. So as a soldier that begins to say, I will no longer cooperate in that process, uh, there's a sort of resistance that happens in them personally over a period of time. Mm -hmm. But there's a resistance that some people, uh, uh, through religious means, be become conscientious objector. But there are those that are become militant in the sense that they say, this is not what I signed up for. I believe in my country. I believe in these ideals of our Constitution. I believe that, you know, we should be the good guys, right? right. Uh, and then they find out we're not the good guys, that we're, you know, we're in a position of so many civilian uh, uh, deaths and, and atrocities and torture and all of these things that happen. And they said, that's not what I signed up for. And I am not going to participate in that. That means either I refuse to obey orders, mm -hmm. I, uh, I vocally become public, I go AWOL, I do whatever it takes because I'm not going to be a part of this system anymore. Now, the general public then has to deal with the idea, well, what does this mean? Do these, these guys are going AWOL. These guys are not obeying orders. They signed a contract. Tell me right, about right. signing a contract. Why well, I, I don't even think, I mean, it's not a contract. Because a, a contract, a legal contract, you know, there's a way to break the contract. Mm -hmm. There's a way to go about doing that. And, uh, you know, so it's more of a signing statement. And, uh, and they say you sign your life away, and that's very literally what you do. And uh, if you do anything that they don't like, they can put you in jail under a separate judicial system. So they really grab you a hook, line, and sinker. You know, so I won't call it a contract at all. And, uh, I mean, the argument... Is sort of invalid anyway. I mean, if you go and look at, when I mean, you're talking about the reasons we join, you know, right. of course I joined, I came from a military family, a, a long lineage of military men and women in my family. I mean, my mother was Air Force, my father was Air Force, that's how they met. Uncle Navy, Uncle Air Force, Grandpa Navy, you know, all the you way down the line. You were born to serve, right? I was born <laughs> to serve. I mean, I was being bred and groomed by my family to go to the Air Force Academy from day one. I mean, that's why I, want, I knew I was going to be in the Air Force by the time I was in first or second grade. I mean, that was, there was no question in my mind. All my energies were bent towards that. So your that. first resistance was to join the Marines? Yeah, actually, that's funny, you know, I, w I was a valedictorian of elementary school, not that that means anything, right, and of middle school, you know, but what the point was, I was on track, I knew the Air Force Academy was competitive, I right. needed to get there, well, I got glasses, at the time, they weren't accepting pilots, you know, I watched yeah. Top Gun all day, that's what I wanted to do, my dad was a pilot, wanted to be a fighter pilot, and, um, well, there, there went my entire life's ambition at the age of 12, that was all I was going to do, and, and I never let go of that sort of military heritage that I really instilled myself with mm -hmm. and uh, you know of course the movies help and you go out and play soldier and all these things uh, but by joining the Marines you know I actually what it was an act of rebellion I mean I come from a long lineage of military officers right and they're intelligence and they were pilots and there were all these things and I walked into the recruiter office and you know even at that age you know, the first thing I told the recruiter is save your pitch you got me so I think there's an understanding there that you are being sold something, you're not being told the entirety of the truth, right? But you still go on and join anyway. And I think this is a military indoctrination because even if you're joining to serve your country or uphold the Constitution, or like my big deal is I want to help people, you know, I want to be the hero and go on and help people. I mean, really the uh, sole existence of the U.S. military has, throughout its entire history, always been for fighting corporate wars. I mean, if you look at a uh, Smedley Butler came out in the 30s, you know, and he said, I've been a pawn for uh, foreign banks, for corporations, and that's all we did, that's all we've ever done. 
and it's always been about this big game. You know, I don't think it's in the human, a lot of people say it's human nature, we're, we're violent, we're violent people. There will always be wars. You hear this sort of myth being propagated as well. There will always be wars, so we always need a military. And no one goes, well, wait, why? Yeah. You know, what, what are the alternatives to that? Well, you, you mentioned Smedley Butler. Uh -huh. uh, for some people may not know who that is. So, as Marine Corps, you can <laughs> yeah, know who right? that is, eh? Yeah, well, very famous, uh, you know, this is funny, you get taught in Marine Corps boot camp about Smedley Butler, but only about his career in the Marine Corps. And he, a bunch of insurgencies against Latin American country, right? All for United Fruit, which is now Dole or Chiquita, I don't know, Chiquita, yeah. Chiquita now. Um, all for, you know, fruit plantations, right, sugar plantations, right, going and subduing uh, the indigenous populations that were there, and a lot of them were tucked back, you know, and so it was really the final infiltration of the continent uh, to set up corporate-led dictatorships throughout the region. And, um, you know, you get your orders in the military, and you think you're doing this or that or the other well, thing. Well, let's, let's still stay with Smedley. Smedley Butler was, oh, yeah. was a general within the, uh, he was a major and then general. A yeah, major general, too, sir, yeah. And and one of the, the, still, the most highly decorated Marine Corps officer oh, yeah. in, Just, in the nation. And as he, he wrote a book called War is a Racket. War is a Racket, and he made a famous speech. And that's why, you know, like, I think after he got out, I was saying, you get your orders, and you just, you assume that, Right. They're legitimate. And after he got out, I think he did what a lot of, you know, resistors, GI resistors do. And he looked back. And if you follow the dollar trail or if you just look what happened after you're there, I mean, it's fairly evident that uh, you're fighting war for industry. And, you know, what a lot of people don't know is there was there was a coup attempt in the United States. And uh, it was a corporate coup attempt. They approached Smedley Butler because they figured he's our man. He's been fighting for us this whole time. We've got him, uh, you know, why is he going to stop now? And uh, they approached him with like a, what, like 100,000 World War I vets that they had all ready to go to go overthrow Washington. I mean, they, and then he comes on, makes a national address. You can look it up on YouTube, on the internet. You can see this. It's our history. We don't get taught it. That's right. So, yeah, Smedley Butler, I mean, pretty, I think, you know, he outlined it. And it, it's always been the same. Standard oil, you know. Right. Right. And I think, too, you know, that uh, that's something when we talk about trying to reach out to people mm -hmm. is for people to read this sort of yeah. history, to learn from this sort of thing. There's also a movie called uh, Sir No Sir, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which talks about the GI resistance movement That's in the Vietnam War. A great documentary, in fact, inspired a lot of uh, IVAW members yeah. over the years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's an incredible movie. I think that even when I, I had gone back to Vietnam in 2006 for um, uh, Agent Orange Conference and uh, Dave Klein was uh, the the found one of the founders of IVAW and um, not IVAW uh, uh, Vietnam Veterans Against the War and Veterans for Peace, and we went back to this conference and he told me this film was coming out because he was featured in it. <laughs> you know? Right. But uh, uh, a brilliant man and an incredible man. And then when we returned about a year later, he had passed away. Uh, but that hit. That was the first time I saw that history. I mean, I knew that there were people, you know, individuals that were speaking out. But I didn't understand the vastness of the GI movement. Mm -hmm. And I was a veteran who came back and saw the people in the streets protesting. And I was, you know, okay with what they were doing, but I didn't want to get involved. I wanted to put the war out of my mind. Mm -hmm. And we were talking earlier about, you know, how do we get, uh, you know, uh, uh, current returning vets to get involved in these movements. Yeah, well, it's tough. You know, I, I can understand why. I didn't want to talk yeah. about war anymore. I'd seen enough of it, and of I wanted course. to be away from all of that stuff, and I wanted to try and rebuild my life. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's one of the difficulties of trying to get veterans uh, to speak out. Some people seem to be speaking out more, and I think maybe that's because the Vietnam veterans against the war, uh, these movements that we stand on other people's shoulders all the yeah, time. Yeah, a we path has more. been blazed. Yeah, so it opened the door for people to speak out. But uh, people are, what, getting... Oh, no. <laughs> people are getting um, uh, arrested. People are going to jail. Mm -hmm. People are that are speaking out are under attack by a vicious right-wing media. Uh, even civilians who try to support those movements are attacked by the, the right-wing movements. Okay. Um, so... How do you uh, talk to veterans about their rights? Mm -hmm. um, you're part of uh, is a GI 
GI rights also? Is that a part of it? Um, well, there is like, you know, education that happens as a, far, a part of that. I think Civilian Soldier Alliance is trying to be aware of not like reinventing the wheel. And okay. Re so there is a GI rights hotline nationally that is really strong. And I would say Kirschner Assist, which you can speak to, does an mm -hmm. amazing job of that. But I wanted to speak to something you said. You said getting veterans involved in the existing anti-war movement. And I think what we're both trying to shift in our strategy and, and sort of be about is that it's not, um, that movement needs to be relevant to to them. And in order for that to be true, like, um, we have to emphasize, like, like, I guess when I'm speaking to people about, um, about what's possible, you know, like, mm -hmm. how do we do this? It's not, um, I, I guess I, I emphasize, like, you know, your experience, like, you know the insides of this machine, and so mm -hmm. you know how to take it apart. Mm -hmm. And, like, that is extremely important. And if we're going to be strategic, like, we need your leadership, you know. So that's kind of, I mean, I guess that's my... Well, if you look at a VVAW or IVAW, we we're talking about the Civilian Soldier Alliance thing. I, I mean, coming back from Vietnam, right, I mean, obviously a lot of vets like yourself, right, you don't want to deal with it right away, but there was, like we said, a, a big movement going. The veterans mm -hmm. movement was just an arm of that with VVAW, but mm -hmm. they had a very large cradle. Uh, and that cradle has uh, been gained less and less, especially with the Obama years. Mm -hmm. wow, and I think that's had a direct effect on the numbers in the veterans movement, right? Because you look at veterans, they're the minority. But we're all United States citizens. You know, that, that's the common factor. But if you're not, if people aren't already there, you know, the comfort factor isn't there. You know, well, a, lot of, a lot of people don't want to blaze the trail first, right. but they're happy to follow. Well, there was a, a, a anti-war movement or well, there, a, and a peace movement yeah, that was large in the beginning. Yeah, of course. But it's mm. uh, like you said. I think uh, as this sort of shift, they get the liberal Democrats get the uh, their president, their man uh -huh. in the mm -hmm. White House. Uh -huh. That all of a sudden it's Obama's war and. It's our guy, so we don't want to attack yeah. him. We want to give him room and mm -hmm. space, right? Give him time. <laughs> give him time, and miracles will uh, happen, right? Uh huh. <laughs> and uh, but the the problem is, is that people are dying every day in these countries, yeah. you know. Uh, and we're not moving. We're not getting out of Iraq. I mean, we have bases there that are going to. No, be no, no. I mean, you, well, I mean, you've got the largest embassy, billion yeah. dollar embassy. <laughs> They're building a bigger one in London. Yeah. It has a moat. In London, <laughs> the building one with the moat. Well, you've got the largest embassy, and they're not, they're replacing <laughs> the, um, the soldiers with contractors. There you go. And mm -hmm. they've had a shortage now of contractors in Afghanistan because they've moved them all to Iraq. Mm -hmm. And so they're pulling from the reserve forces to do contracting work in Afghanistan. I mean, it's a big show. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's been no decrease in troop deployment numbers. There's only been increases, increases in tour length, increases in numbers, increases in everything. You know, except benefits and things like right. that. But right. You know, and the Congress has always walked that line. I mean, you have to, and, and they're walking that line and they know exactly what they're doing. They're throwing the public a bone, you know, and that, that's what makes advocacy hard because everyone does support taking care of people that come home that have mental problems, right? But Congress is walking the line of how little funding can we give them mm -hmm. so they don't storm the Congress hall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're throwing us bones and they're giving us just enough to squeak by. And uh, every time there's a small victory, I mean, that's great. But if you, if you look what happens two years down the way, legislation undoes it, undoes it, you know, every yeah. couple of years. Undoes it? Undoes, undoes it. it. <laughs> undoes I like it. See, that. I'm forgetting my English. I'm it, still yeah. getting back into English. <laughs> Can we do this in Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I want to make a couple of announcements here, too. Uh, <clears throat> or kind of halfway through the program, a little over half. Uh, there's going to be an event uh, uh, called Travis Drums. This is going to be at uh, 12 to 2 p.m. August 1st at uh, Portland Peace Memorial Park. Uh, Veterans for Peace is uh, hosting that with this Lynn uh, Braderick who pulled this together. Uh, her oldest son, a Marine Corps Corporal, uh, Travis Braddock Nall, uh, was killed uh, by an explosion in uh, uh, a U.S. cluster bomb during, uh, during, it says, unexploded munitions clearing operation in Karbala, Iraq on July second 2003 and since he you know he was a drummer she wants mm -hmm. to she wants to bring out as many people that play drums so if you play the drum or you got pots and pans or you got <laughs> something you, know, you can hit mm -hmm. just come out to the peace park uh, it's at the east end of the steel bridge um it's the largest peace symbol in the oregon uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, hopefully the beautiful United view States. of the river <laughs> uh, we're going to just start beating uh uh 
to a to a different drummer. You know? Perfect. You recognize uh, Travis. This is one thing that people can just at least come out there, make a little bit of a statement, do a tribute to a veteran, and then talk to the people that are there. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, another event that's coming up is called the Sli S Sli uh, Civilian Liberty Civil Liberties uh, do, Defense huh? Center benefit. Yeah, I, I was in. Uh, in Cuba, no. <laughs> <laughs> Civil Liberties Defense uh, Center benefit. This is Saturday, August 14th uh, this year uh, at 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. at Autonomy, uh, I guess that's the name of the place, at 316 Northwest 4th, Portland, Oregon, 97209. Um, this, is, um, this is being put on by the Oregon uh, uh, Jericho Movement and Political Prisoner Support. Mike Crenshaw, a good friend of mine, uh, will be performing. There's going to be a number of performances. Becky White, uh, Trey Arrow uh, from the <clears throat> he was he went to jail for his uh, political environmental political activism. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey Lures, uh, anarchist who also spent some time in prison. Uh, Dapper uh, Cadavers, Dapper Cadavers, mm -hmm. I like that, and a number of uh, different people for that night. So if you get a chance. Go out to these events. You're going to meet people that are active across the board, which is sort of coalitions of people, of students and activists, from veterans issues to political prisoners. And when you talk about, you know, these movements got to be broader. Uh, one thing that I ran across then when we're talking about some of these events is that some people say that everybody wants to bring all this list of things out. And mm -hmm. for the public, it, when they see this banner of, of ideas, they become confused and they don't know. Yeah, you know, and veterans want to say, "End the war, uh -huh. uh, bring uh -huh. the troops home." Simple. Uh, others want to add, you know, uh, the the crisis in the economy. Others want to add, you know, free movement of which more, uh, which right, 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 which right. needs to happen. All these different mm -hmm. things, uh -huh. and there's this sort of confusion. But it seems to me that if we start talking about just one of these things and make it very clear to people that we're advocating for right. one of these issues and bring people out. All those issues can be talked about, yeah. you know, but you need to make it clear so that people come out and they're not looking in all these different mm -hmm. directions. And I think that's... You talked a, about division, so... Yeah, I mean, it's huge division. It's also a testament <coughs> to numbers. I mean, I think a lot of people can get behind all those issues, uh, you know, but the movement as it is right now has been, um, you know, I think it's been intentionally fractured. If you look at, go back to Army intelligence books during the Vietnam War, I mean, the first thing they said about dissent was to, to infiltrate the group mm -hmm. and start creating boundaries, start creating conflicts. So that was really the birth, and it's not the birth, but it's the birth of the sub subverting movements. You know, people think that's not happening right now. So you can get behind those issues. I think that people are just looking for... You know, they, everyone wants their issue to be important, right? right? And so they're all going to try to bring it to the front scene. And if you don't have enough people in the movement, right, to sustain each of those individual movements, like we have a march for this today, we have a march for this the next day, right? And you get everyone behind that clear, concise message. I and mean, that's what we need. I mean, we can have more than one message, but not at one time, you know. Mm -hmm. But now we've just got pockets of different groups, right, that uh, aren't really operating unilaterally, right? They're on all different pages, 15 here, 15 here. And there's not that many marches, you know. There's just not. We have a Memorial Day march, and so everyone comes out, you know. You know, people, I, why aren't people marching every day? I mean, it came out just, what, this year that Tony Blair had made millions, special envoy to the Middle East, prime mm -hmm. minister, right? He's made millions of dollars in oil contracts, right? It came out that BAE Corporation was, you know, what, you know, in Saudi Arabia, selling weapons. So all this, the war movement, the anti-war movement, and the peace movement has been completely vindicated by all this, right? Everything they said was happening mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. has now come true. Everything the press called them crazy conspiracy theorists about has now come true. But where are they now? Mm -hmm. You know, you're right. You know, okay, so why don't you march down there and go get Tony Blair? Uh, he's buying a moat, <laughs> you know. So they've been, everyone's been proven correct. And, uh, but now that they've been proven correct, they're, they're not doing anything. But I think that speaks to, I mean, we talked about this earlier, about the strategy, right? Like, um, all these movements are, are kind of fragmented because so-and-so's against this and so-and-so's against this. And, uh -huh. and we're against uh -huh. the war and we're going to end the occupation. And that's a, that's a, a goal that we want, right. but strategically, like, what are we for? And, like, that's yeah. where people start to come together. Mm. Like, we are for 
you know, we talked about this, mental health care, yeah, yeah, yeah. mental health care for everyone. You know, that's where those that's where those threads start to come together. And, and well, and that's so. why I really advocate, we were talking about education, I really advocate education because, you know, people get confused, right, by not having a clear message. Right. But there's something wrong with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that kind of shows us, like, how dumb we are as, you know, Americans. And it's not our fault. Like, we're victims of an educational system that's doing worst among all the developed nations. I mean, we're victims of a lot of indoctrination, a lot of advertising, and it's very much meant to, to keep us down and to keep us divided. I mean, if you have a little bit of historical, even recent historical knowledge, I mean, you'll be able to tie all the issues in the peace activist movement together and go, okay, but we're not there yet, right? We need to build some social, we need to get spread the knowledge, get it out there, it's on the internet, right? We need to get people turning off their TVs, and just go on YouTube. You know, what, what do you want to know about? I want to know about fluoride in the water. Just type into YouTube. You can yeah. learn all about it, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. So if you want to learn about anything necessary in the peace movement, it doesn't well, take that much research. The national libraries are on that. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's yeah. on yeah. Everything. You know, there. people edit their own videos about <coughs> topics. And, they, right. and you can watch. But you can pick and choose, though. You can pick yeah. the things that bring you only the information you want. So then you become a limited. Right. Yeah. Well, so, so I. So you, you need, know, some, you need to watch 15 things you know, about right. the same subject. And right. Think for yourself, you know. <clears throat> well, th th there's a question there. I, I mean, I, I think education is really important. Uh -huh. And I think history is really important. Of course. But I don't think it's necessary, necessary to, f uh, uh, to figure out Right. That there's something that's right and wrong. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, I didn't have all the history that uh -huh. I know now uh, when I decided, you know, I wasn't going to cooperate anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have all that history uh, or knowledge uh, uh, about what was happening, uh, who was pulling what strings, right. uh, when I decided, you know, I'm resisting. Yeah. And, and that happened even when I was in Vietnam, you know. Uh -huh. It's just I got angry was I thought, this is wrong. This is not how you treat human beings. This is right. not how you treat people. That's just very basic. Now, I had to start educating myself so that I could argue exactly. against those people who mm -hmm. were telling me that's not the way it is. You know, mm -hmm. you're wrong. This is we need to do this. We're protecting our country. Then I didn't have the information right. to argue, but I had the information enough right and wrong to uh -huh. say I'm not going to participate. Uh -huh. Then I had to go in and, and get that education so I could become knowledgeable and, and be able to at least have something to carry and to show and to prove and to have uh -huh. evidence of you know, and b break it down. But as I learned those things, it became self-evident. Right. I knew, I, f I really realized I knew these things inst you instinctually, yeah. you know, and it just became uh, more self-evident as I began to read and learn. And it's, uh -huh. and it's nothing new. I, when I started reading literature, I mean, it goes back to Dostoevsky, you know, uh -huh. it goes, goes uh -huh. back to Camus, uh, you know, it goes back to all these great writers in history, uh, uh, the women's movement, you know, and you start reading, I, I learned a lot through art history. Uh -huh. And uh -huh, I would take that through art history and see, you know, here's a movement that started because of this, that, because these artists were actually served in this war. And, right. they, and they, were, they were anarchists and they were uh, doing something different. And technology was happening at the time. Yeah. And so you started seeing that all these things were layered mm -hmm. in various ways uh -huh. and from different perspectives, you know. Yeah. And it, I learned through that direction and then started going into well, I social think political everyone, history. I think everyone does. And I think you can do that, you know, in whatever field you're in. And so reaching out to people is, is such an important part. I also wanted to bring up Courage to Resist. Yeah, great organization. You know, uh, I mean, right now they have a campaign, Courage to Resist. Uh, you can just go to www.couragetoresist.org. And you can find out uh, uh, names of people that are currently, um, you know, that are either being held in uh, military prisons, uh, are objectors that need uh, uh -huh. are fighting their legal cases. Because we encourage people to not just go AWOL and, and disappear, but also to come out and speak, uh, go through the process of, of filing for your, you know, to, to be released from the military uh -huh, uh -huh. and closing all those doors. So people aren't encouraging people to break laws. They're encouraging no. people to stand up for what's right, mm -hmm. right in this country. And and those people that are, we I think they need support. There's um, right now it's uh, support for PFC Bradley Manning, um, courage, uh, courage soldiers uh, face 52 years in prison for sharing the video on our, on our soldiers uh, and 
being killed by U.S. troops in Baghdad. This is a WikiLeaks mm -hmm. video. Mm -hmm. um, these are, we're talking about now people that put that out, but even the WikiLeaks itself, uh, the founder, uh, what was his name? I forget his name, the guy. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> anyhow, he, my brain. He, he's actually had to go underground right now because there's almost like uh, uh, assassination attempts to yeah. go after him to shut this down, but they're I think speaking they're up. up in Iceland. Iceland's passing yeah, the media <laughs> protection law. That's right. And uh, I think, you know, it's, it's actually going against the idea of the, the rule for whistleblowers. Right. You know, I mean, you, we should be supporting whistleblowers. Well, yeah, yeah I, mean, that's pr I mean, this is a perfect <coughs> example of how our, our, you know, civil rights and liberties have been eroded away. And then when you're talking about courage to resist and going through the process, yeah. we're not breaking law. I mean, you're trying to affirm laws that should be practiced and there in place go. already. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what you're really trying to do. When you talk about having a, a standing military, if you go back to the, I mean, yeah, for, for defense of the nation, right. right? Those are the affirmed laws. And, of course, they've been mutilated into this uh, construct that we have now, this juggernaut, which is really the world's police force. And who, who's supposed to be able to declare war? Congress, I heard. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, I heard that, I too. And as a video uh, uh, pointed out, so... Uh -huh. Clearly, was that you know we, the average person, doesn't have any voice in this. Well, and, yeah, and, yeah. and and what mm -hmm. civilian population has ever declared war on another? This population? has just been a long journey. You know, it's from the establishment of privatizing the Federal Reserve in 1913 through the National Security Act in 1947 through Korea, Vietnam. As this all has progresses uh, through Nixon making the dollar hegemony. No one mm -hmm. ever talks about dollar hegemony in war. Uh, taking us off the gold standard, making the dollar a world reserve currency. And when you zoom up all the way to um, the Reagan, Bush, and then 9-11, after 9-11, I mean, we really well, made... But even the gold standard didn't mean any... I mean, what you're, you're, you're talking about is you put one thing here and another thing here, uh -huh. and you put a value on it, and you distribute so many coins to be, oh, you know... It, it's it's who's pulling the strings on yeah. whatever. I like the idea that, that was you talking about it or you talking about earlier today when we're saying... Uh, uh, a city produces their yeah, own local currency. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the colonies yeah. were doing that. Part of the reason leading up to the revolution <laughs> is that when the colonies started issuing colonial script, the Bank of England started pulling silver, the backing for it, out of the e economic supply. I mean, that was a major lead up. You know, of course. Uh, but it's also, I mean, the system is about accumulation of, oh, yeah. of wealth uh, through exploitation of, of workers. Course. But if you if the workers own the product, uh, I mean, it changes uh, everything. It changes the <laughs> it changes whole. Everything. I mean, I mean, there are uh, um, worker-owned right. collectives. I mean, even uh, uh, certain beer companies in in Oregon are, uh -huh. are that way. Mm -hmm. uh, there's coffee shops. Coffee Strong. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. coffee, talk about Coffee Strong a little bit. Well, I mean, I'm not the best the best representative, but it is a really incredible example um, coming out of the tradition of coffee houses in Vietnam that were near bases to to s provide that space for people to have a critical perspective and kind of process their experience, talk about their rights. Coffee Strong is, is in that tradition its own and run by veterans um, who came out of Fort Lewis and um, stuck around in that area to, to build this space and to, to hold this space. And um, yeah, I think what's super important about their model is they're not about, um, when I say they're not about politics, I mean they're about the values of yeah, defending the rights of these service members, and that comes first. They're not like peace signs all over the place, da da da. Like that's not what speaks to the reality of of people who are active duty or who are just out and are living near the base. You know, so um, yeah. Yeah, and you've been up there to Coffee Strong. Oh yeah, great group of guys. You know, if you look at uh, you know the owner of Coffee Strong, I mean, he's so styles a yeah, so styles a cropped haircut. You know, he he's you not know, the owner; he's a co-owner. Well, he's a co-owner. <laughs> I mean, I think owner is a bad word yeah. for that. You know, because it's but um, yeah, yeah, I mean, but he's one of the driving forces behind yes, he making is. it happen. You know, he's got two kids; he's making it. Happen. He's doing all these things. He's working two jobs and. Well, I mean, this has been incredibly there's successful. There's another guy project. up there, uh, Josh. Yeah, Josh went to Venezuela with us. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Well, t talk about a little bit about going down to Venezuela. What was that about? Well, we went down there, you know, on a ten-day delegation, and basically we were um, the peace delegation. Yeah, it was peace, peace and peace, media delegation. Peace and media delegation, right? So we traveled down with media activists that were picking up tips from the local media. And we were around. We saw, you know, labor organization. We did a lot in 10 days and then the veterans contingent and we were protesting the um 
building the bases in Colombia, which, uh, you know, Colombia is becoming the, the, well, it is a satellite state for uh, U.S. foreign policy in South America. Uh, it's because, you know, Costa Rica wasn't south enough, so they keep moving farther south. So this was uh, last September you went yeah, down? Yeah, we went down September 3rd. We're there for 10 days. I did a lot of interviews, things like that, and then after And you just got back from there now. And I just got back. Because uh, we were waiting for a report a long time back. Yeah, I, I missed my return <laughs> ticket, and I just ended up staying. But, uh, so what were you doing while you were down there? When I was down there, I was, uh, well, I mean, surviving, for one. I, I mean, it's a tough about city. That. Talk about that. Uh, well, it's, you know, Caracas has uh, some of the highest violence, most expensive city. Um, it's a very interesting culture, right? It's an oil state, right? It has lots of U.S. cultural influence, like a lot of places in the world. And, you know, just daily survival there is, is an all-day challenge. I mean, it takes all your energies, you know? So you, you don't got a lot of time to, act, uh, to organize, to be an activist, but people are still doing it down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're turning the boat around, and they're making... If it's going to take you, oh, I don't know, three hours to go to the bank, you know, what else are you going to get done? And that's very much the reality of it. And then you got you got to go home, you got to worry about not getting robbed when you're coming out of the bank and things like that. They have very, very embedded violence. And, you know, and it's not their fault either, right? I mean, there's a whole social political history of this. Um, but, you know, over time I, I met a bunch of people. I was teaching English, like I said, and I started writing for an international newspaper, which you can look up on uh, venezuelanalysis.com. They've got lots of great articles there in English, and then just click on the right, the uh, Correo del Orinoco, and uh, you can usually see a great article, just international perspective, right, from Venezuela, where there is a social movement happening. Well, what is that social movement? Well, it's, uh, they're calling it the Bolivarian Revolution, they're calling it 21st century socialism, right? You can give it all- You mean you're a communist? Yeah, no, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that's one of the things, you know, people write, People try to compare it to uh, the Cuban <clears throat> Revolution. If you're doing that, you're just lying to yourself and confusing the issue, right? There's almost no, no similarities except for sovereignty, mm -hmm. right? Just having sovereignty over your own commodities, right? Your own resources. And that's but they wrote their own constitution. Oh, they right? rewrote the constitution, constitution. right? The people voted councils. on it. I mean, they've got, you know, five branches of government down there. Now, One somebody of them said there like were like 400 articles? Oh, yeah, there's, well, I'm not sure how many there is. There's a lot. There's over 100. I know yeah, that. there's over 100 <laughs> articles. And, uh, yeah. And we have how many in ours? Not that many. <laughs> not that many. We're I forget. We're significantly I, I, less. But, you know, the, 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 <clears throat> the thing is, is each of these little councils, people came in and began writing what they thought was important for human liberty. and And, right. uh, and rights to land, and rights to yeah, education, and yeah. rights for women, and rights for children. And yeah, you know, all I of think these the best. Things. You know, if you're a housewife yeah. in Venezuela, you are given a stipend for doing a social service. You know, of course, you are doing a social service. You're right. bringing the next generation into being. And you know, here we don't place a lot of value on home education. Right? We got double income families now. Sometimes like triple, quadruple income families. Mom and dad are both working. The TV and uh, public education is raising your kids. So what right. agenda are they going to be getting? Well, I think people should also kind of take a look at, there's a movie coming out. Yeah, uh, South of the Border. South of the Border, um, Oliver Stone's new documentary. I just saw the uh, uh, pre-screening of this uh, last week. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, it is, uh, I mean, for me, I know a lot of this stuff, but it's uh, interviewing all of these uh, presidents that have taken uh, right. a step against the austerity movement of the uh -huh. IMF and the World mm -hmm. Bank, uh, and how these various Which presidents... Which are happening here, by the way, now. That's right. So it's good to learn that history. It's, it's good to, 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 to see these presidents as human beings. Because Oliver Stone, it's kind of like this. He's just talking to them like we're talking uh -huh. to each other here, uh -huh. you know? And, uh, and he's just, he tries to get... He's, uh, Chavez, uh, get on uh, get on that bike over there, right around. You used to be uh -huh, Chavez uh -huh. is riding this bike, mm -mm. and it breaks. <laughs> he falls down, you know. And uh, but he, I mean, it's all the sense of humor. And he says, yeah. "Oh, Chavez goes, uh, uh, I think I'm going to have to buy this thing." Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You break it, you buy it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but just this idea that these people that weren't being treated like gods. Yeah, they, they were being. They were human beings who had this idea in their head that was supported by their people, were elected into those positions, and they're trying to make a difference under a barrage of attacks from uh -huh. uh, the opposition. And well, I mean, <coughs> which is a very heavily funded opposition movement. Yeah. 
Right. Now, part of that peace delegation, like you said, was about Colombia. Yeah. So uh, when you went and, and the Honduras uh, coup had just taken place, uh -huh. and the we got, got was, down. Yeah. So you began to talk. I mean, I seen the interviews of you and Josh and, and Jerry and stuff. Uh, but one of the things you just mentioned to me earlier today was the, that the, that there may be a a real friction, uh, a war almost starting between uh, uh, Venezuela and Colombia. Yeah. What was this about? Uh, I mean, this this was a recent. Well, uh, Colombia just came out and, and made, uh, which they've been doing, but uh, they just, you know, new elections come out and made very blatant, ac untrue accusations of Venezuela, you know, as far as we know. Uh, you know oh, yeah, supporting uh, FARC. And supporting uh, the FARC and the ELN, <coughs> which is, you know, if you look back and trace their funding, their funding's coming from companies like BP, <coughs> like Coca-Cola. They're breaking up the unions. They're murder. You know, it's, it's a bot. A lot of it's bot already. Uh, you know, so accusing Venezuela, it's just scapegoating, it's scapegoating, mm -hmm. you know, it's like you set up Saddam Hussein to be this brutal dictator and then you blame him for the atrocities, right? You know, how did you know he had the weapons? Well, we sold them to him, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, and so these accusations come out, Venezuela's, you know, responded by checking out, um, you know, the sites, saying they're military to these supposed sites. I mean, some of these images came off Google Maps. Right. You know, they traced them to Google Maps, which is something, by the way, the U.S., does not do. I mean, the Russian president, Mendev, came over with a whole list of drug lords from Afghanistan and gave them to President Obama. He said, these are all drug lords from Afghanistan. They're all living in your country. And Obama filed in the shredder. Right? So even though that there's not good relationships between Venezuela and Colombia, right? Venezuela said, okay, we're going to investigate this. Right? They just had the UN come in. Uh, the UN had a lot of misrepresentation from even places like Amnesty International in Venezuela, right? It's been infiltrated. And uh, they said, well, let, let's show you, right? And the UN was, okay, great, you know? Okay. Yeah, we're getting down to about one minute. I, you see how fast this goes? <laughs> <laughs> you, I mean, there's never enough time. I can to, talk for like 10 hours, too. So. <laughs> I no, I mean, these are important things. And I think, again, it's to let people know. How, do they, how can people get a hold of you? Um, they can go to our website, www.sibsoul.org. Or that, there it is. It's, we got it up on. I think, perfect it, I think it comes up on that screen. screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, yeah. Or we have an email info at sibsoul.org also. Good. Mm -hmm. And who they're going to contact that way? They're going to get you. They'll reach. They'll reach myself and other members of our. There's other civilian allies that are. Now, do you, involved. is there any regular meetings or? Are you well, we're all spread out around the country right now. Okay. So if po people in Portland should contact me, and we can get together for sure. Okay, that sounds great. And Benji, you're just you're you're here for today, and then you're probably be going down back down to Eugene. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. uh, are you going to be doing anything special uh, coming up? Or well, I'm working on getting things back, but I've only been back for like a week, so okay. Give me a minute, but IVAW. So, okay, we want to say IVAW hyphen Oregon hyphen Oregon dot org. Okay, folks, uh, join us again next uh, uh, next fourth Saturday, and we'll be glad to talk to you again. Have a good one. Hey, thank you both for being here. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> it's good to be here. Hey, brother.